It has been many, many, many years ago. I remember uh, going on a youth trip uh, at Camp Arrowhead. And uh, in fact, Jeff, you were on that trip with me. Jeff and I are about the same age, and we, were, we went to Florida Street. And I remember uh, Mark McDougall. Mark, if you ever hear this, yeah, I said your last name there. But I remember Mark, he, uh, you know, he was there with us. He'd been down there before we were. And uh, he, Mark says, hey, man, come on over here to this golf cart, you know, and uh, let's jump on this golf cart, and we'll drive back to our campsite. We had a huge campsite there. Let's go ahead and just get in the golf cart and drive back. So we, we drive in the golf cart all over the Camp Arrowhead campground. And, you know, you know and I'm like, this is pretty cool. You know, Mark, we're out, this is a nice golf cart. And as we get to wherever we're going, I'll never forget this, Mark jumps off the golf cart, looks at everybody around him, and says, look what I stole. I spent the next half day in the office there at the Camp Arrowhead as we explained uh, how, how we had uh, been misled, misled. Now, you know what? Our words mean things, don't we? When people say something, we, we want to believe it. We want to believe that it's true. James speaks to this. The book of James. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn to uh, James. You're, you're gonna, we're going to be at the latter part of one, and then we're going to look at chapter two of James today. And uh, we're going to be studying in the book of James. And if I could, I would like to read the tail end of James around verse uh, 26. In fact, this, means, this is, has, was a life verse for me when I was 14 and 15. You've heard me say it before. You'll hear me say it thousands of times, probably after today. And that's my mom used to always made, make me read the book of James when I talked back to her. So needless to say, by the time I was 15, I had read the book of James more than Charles Stanley. I had read it quite a few times. I know the book of James. And this verse in particular sits, sits here, sits, sits home with me. Makes, reminds me of my mother uh, as I read it when it says this. In 26 of chapter 1, it says, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this time you've given us together. Thank you for just some moments to open your word and study the scriptures and to, to both be educated, edified, and corrected all in one sitting. Now, Father, would you be with this time that we spend together, open our hearts, open our minds to what we need to hear. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The one thing that, that by the way, and if you want to know uh, some, some phrases to be careful of uh, in your life as a Christian, phrases to be careful of, don't be one of those Christians that are always going, I'm going to go give them a piece of my mind. You know what, they ain't heard the last of me. You know what, I'm going to, you know, they're going to know what I'm thinking. You know, having, getting that at, you know the attitude I'm talking about. You know, that, that attitude, they're going to they're gonna get it. They're going to hear it from me. And it may come out even a little bit profane. But see, here's the thing about that. That when, when you do that, especially as a Christian, when you act that way, when your mouth gets the best of you and, you and it starts going, what it says, speaks to is that you're not bridling your tongue. You're not bridling, you're not bridling your tongue. And there'll be later chapters that we look at this closer. But when we don't bridle our tongue, it's just like a horse. You know, we put the bridle in the horse's mouth, we put that bit in there to help direct them. You better keep that bit in your own mouth and watch what you say. Do you realize how easy it is for you to, to ruin your testimony in, in a matter of a few words? Totally ruin, blow your testimony. That is even why I've been, I've been careful at the way I speak to just what happened. In Paris, you may have seen where they mocked the, the communion, the, the Lord's Supper, that they, they made an utter mockery of the Lord's Supper. 
And, and I want to speak to that just for a moment in, in that I even had to watch the way that things. The first thing you want to start doing when you see that is to just go off on whoever it is that is doing it, whatever the case is. But you need to remember something about the people you're speaking to. They are darkened in their understanding. Romans 1, 18 through 29 says that they are they've literally, God's turned them over to a depraved mind. They are darkened. They don't even know what they're doing. Why do you think it is when Jesus was on the cross, Jesus looked all around him and said, Father, forgive them for they what? They don't know what they're doing. They don't even realize what they're doing. They're so depraved. They, they're so set on doing and, and acting out the sin that they're enslaved to that they literally would do something like blaspheme the name of Jesus in the way that they did. But you also, this has also opened up a lot of conversations on the streets of Paris. But here's the sad part. The sad part for me, it wasn't as much what the, the LGBTQ uh, ABCDEFG group did in, in that case there. It wasn't just that. It was the response of those on the street who said, I don't, I don't even know what's wrong with that. I don't even know. They went throughout the streets of Paris. I had one particular commentator going throughout the streets of Paris talking to people about what they had seen, and literally there is no response whatsoever. They're like, I don't, I don't know what the big deal is. Why? It's because they don't have Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So how else are they going to respond? you got to remember, you can't expect a, 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 a non-Christian to act like they're a Christian. But I tell you this, you can sure model for them the way Christians act. So act like a Christian. And, and getting back to that, be one who controls your tongue. Be one who controls your tongue. Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Uh, sometimes, I, as some of the old, old, the, the old school moms, I see them, you know, their child, if they're two or three years old, have you ever seen them pop? Have you ever got your mouth popped when you were a kid? Yeah, you, you have. Uh, now, I'm saying that there's, there's not a fine line here between, you, you know, that pop, that little pop uh, on, on, the, on the lips, I've seen it correct many uh, young people when I was a kid and make them all of a sudden go, whoa, i got to watch what I say. Well, maybe we ought to pop our own mouths, okay? So if I see you somewhere out in, your, out in a food line or, or somewhere and I, I see you pop in your mouth, I know, good girl, good boy. <laughs> you're, at least you're, you're watching what you say. So if anyone, and here's the thing about it, you got to remember, if you claim to be religious and you can't control your own tongue, then something's wrong something is wrong and it means that your religion according to James is worthless it's worthless it means nothing 26 nothing but what let, let's let's go one step closer and this is why I didn't want to I didn't want to glaze over this last week I wanted to take a moment and emphasize this in in verse 27 of chapter 1 it spells out what pure and undefiled religion looks like. It says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction. And to keep oneself unstained from the world. Let's, that, that visit orphans and widows part for a moment is, is speaks to something that we as Christians should have. And that's that we should have a deep sense of compassion and love for those who have lost. A deep compassion. Not, not just a glazed over. In, in so many cases, we get so busy with our own lives. We get so busy doing whatever it is we want to do in our own lives that we lose track of those around us. One thing I tried to do uh, early on, I, I, think in, in, I think I used to care, even, even Noah used to go, go places with me a lot when he was younger. 
and me because that's how my, what my dad did with me he would take me places when I was just a little thing and he would take me to the different places to minister to people on different levels and fronts and sometimes my dad would quiz me and say son what was it about that person that that you remembered the most what was it what was what that person was that person hurting what was that person hurting about do you think what was wrong it, it would stir me to look and I'm encouraging you just quit looking over those who have hurts and needs around you and, and in an easy way he throws out some some easy like some low-hanging fruit ways just when he speaks to orphans and to widows there are certain groups here in Northside that we really love working with one in fact I just heard from Kevin Qualls the president of, of uh, Christian Adoption Services and uh, who works with the Baptist children, children's home, the orphans' homes in, uh, in, here in North Carolina. And in it, they try to make, take vulnerable children who need to come to know Jesus, and they get, they get parents cleared that now can take in children, and, and those children can grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord who may have no parents or no future apart from a family coming and giving them a forever home a forever home in in the scriptures it teaches us that that we are to do this that when we talk about visiting the orphans and the widows that we should look at their needs and we should find ways to reach out to them here at Northside one of the things that we try to do is uh, through the, the Romeo Ministries. Uh, by the way, for our visitors, Romeo Ministries in our church is retired old men eating out. Okay, just, just so you know. And, uh, but these retired old men that eat out don't just eat out. Uh, they go and they minister to the, some of our senior adult widows that are in need and need help. Maybe have something that, that, that they need and so they minister to their needs because they need the help. They, they need to be able to get the help. Uh, and so according to the scripture here, we're giving a couple of low-hanging fruit ideas for ways that you can find to reach and minister to others. Simply it says here, visiting orphans, maybe looking out for the needs of, and then the widows in their affliction. And this leads us into... To verse 1 because I think this is right now prominently in our society one of the the biggest things that we deal with uh, in this society is that of of a uh, trying to recognize people strictly by their minority status by their the, the color of their skin by their uh, where they're from in the world their race they, they try we they try to place such an emphasis on it I believe they sometimes can short circuit the ability for races across all nations to have relationships and, and the Bible here's the thing is if, if the the government would just simply pick up a Bible and say look here's what the Bible says about how we should treat everyone it would be amazing the problems that we see today the, div the v divisions among races and creeds and and lifestyle choices would be vanquished because we would be abiding by what the scriptures say it says in in fact it, it says in verse one of chapter two my brothers show all the partiality in the world that's not what it says is it it says to show no partiality as you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. To not show partiality. And so, what are some of the ways that we can show partiality? Let's, let's look at it, because James really is specific about this. So if, it says, if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, what does that mean? Rich. Is that, can we agree on that? It means rich. I tell you, in this society and in the American society, it means richer in debt. <laughs> One or the other, okay? It says, if they come in wearing gold, ring, fine clothing, they come into your assembly. And it says here, but then a poor man comes in, shabby, 
clothing also comes in. And for if a, a man wearing a gold ring and fine linen comes to your assembly, and that man comes in with that shabby clothing, it says, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place. Oh, in other words, you sit in this seat over here. And while you say to the poor man, you sit over there or you sit at my, you sit at my feet. See, it's, what it's doing here is it's saying, how do you treat people? Do you look and size up people based on what's on the outside? Do you make an outside assessment of someone and then based on how they are dressed or how they look or what car they've come driving up in is going to be how you speak to them or how you treat them? For that matter, what if a, a, what if a man comes up to you pu pushing a shopping cart down the street and he's not in the parking lot <laughs> of, of the food line? So how are you going to treat them? Do you treat them different? Do you treat them with less respect? How, how do you do that? Do you size up people based on what they are wearing? How they're acting? Uh, how, what, what do you do here? And, it's, and James is saying this because it's happening frequently within the diaspora in the churches and the surrounding areas. They're, it's happening all the time, and he's addressing this. The Pharisees were, were the worst about it. But he's, he's addressing this here, and he's saying, how do you treat people? Let, let's pause there for a minute. How do you treat people? Do, do you, and I, I admit it, you know, we work here in, in, at Northside, we work with the homeless all the time. In fact, I was just down at the R IRC um, on Friday, and uh, it was a mess. It was during the, the time the IRC, there's a certain hours in the IRC where they get everybody to come outside of the building and they clean the inside. And everyone is outside. And you even see the groups that begin to congregate little by little and they kind of separate themselves out. But I got a chance to, to talk to a lot of the people there. And, I, and by the way, I have to do a lot of things that I don't like doing. I have to kind of turn off my profanity monitors off my ears because I'm going to hear some profanity while I'm there because if, if I'm if I base if I'm going to talk to someone on, on them not cussing at me or something as I'm talking to them I may as well leave because they're just everyone is in such a bad place there but it is amazing when they begin to realize that you really do have a concern or care for them that they will settle down and they will listen. Because you see, they, they're not, they, they go places all the time and are just literally pushed along, treated poorly, treated without respect. And quite frankly, I know there's some there that I tell them, you got to, get, you got to give respect to get respect sometimes. You have to do that. But I see how they're treated. And see, we as Christians... We need to be the ones that show that example of how we don't size up people based on what they are wearing or what they're driving or how much money's in their bank account in order to, to minister to them. When I see, what, as we begin to, as we read this, it, it, I see a picture being painted that we need to understand. The people that we help in many cases, even in Northside, are not the people that we are going to see quickly come in back into the church or sit in a pew or, or here in the church or come to a service all the time. And if we base how we help them on whether or not they're going to respond back to us, then we, we won't help them at all. Sometimes we just have to be obedient. That's why James even specifies this when he, when we talk, when he talks about uh, these different commands he gives in, in the book of James, there's like about 106 verses, and out of 106 verses, 52 times he tells you, you're going to do this. This is how you're going to do it. He, he gives a command. And so in, in this case here, it's not always about us looking for reciprocation, someone giving back to us what we give. It's we are to do these things. We are to be that person that doesn't size people up by what they're wearing. 
We don't make people that are stinky and not dress well sit at our feet where, where, or treat them less than. They're going to be treated equally across the board. Now, it, it is true. When you're dealing with a homeless population, they're, they're really in what I call a survival mode. And you, there may be certain things that you have to watch for and be careful about with the homeless. I admit that. But when it gets to showing them the love of Jesus, we treat all equally. We treat everyone equally. Four says, have you not then made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? We're, it's not our job to judge or size up people in that fashion. Listen, my beloved brother, has not God chosen those who were poor in the world to be rich and in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? When we talk about what true riches are in the scriptures, we're talking about two different kinds of riches. Matthew speaks to this when it talks about where your treasure is. Where your treasure is, your heart's going to be there where your treasure is. They're going to be together. And when it comes to where we're storing treasure, it's, it, it means that we're pr not prioritizing how much money's in our bank account, but we're storing up heavenly riches. And those heavenly riches are what is being spoken of in the scripture. It says that are the poor in the world, the poor in the world actually are the rich, because they're the ones who are rich in faith. They're the ones who have have more. They're the ones who have things. I you know, there there are moments, by the way, I want to go on some crazy like around the world vacation to different places all over the world. But I think also about the fact of how much it means to store up heavenly riches and having all those heavenly riches stored that one day I will be able to access when I reach my, my heavenly home. Six says, but you have dishonored the poor man. It says, are not the rich the ones who oppress you and, and then the ones who drag you into court? It says here that, that there is the poor man, but then the rich are the same ones. You know, you're trying to honor rich people. You're trying to, to honor those who are of high class or status, but they're the same ones at this point in the culture that will drag you into court in a heartbeat over anything. Maybe they, you owe them some money, whatever the case is. They're going to treat you without respect. Seven says, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Wow. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall, what does it say? Love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. And by the way, this, this part about loving our neighbor as ourselves. We live in a society and culture that will, if you, if you are blessed enough to have a garage, you roll that garage up the remote, you get your car in the garage, you roll that do door behind you, and you're, you're there until you leave again. There's, there's that interaction. I, there, it's, it, it's neat when you know your neighbors, when you know those around you, and you can be an influence to those around you. I even challenge you that, that spend some time getting to know those who are around you. Because how can you love your neighbor if you don't even know your neighbor? My neighbor next door is one of the sweetest, uh, kind of wonderful people that you've ever met. They're uh, from the Montagnard culture. And uh, they, uh, Lon's his name. And I remember Lon, it, there's nothing that they would not do for us. There's absolutely nothing they wouldn't do for us. And, and there is something to nurturing these relationships because as you, as you grow close to those around you, it just changes the whole culture and the whole feel of your neighborhood when you begin to know those around you, to love your neighbor truly as yourself. If I could read, so I'll pick up with 8 to 9. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. But if you show partiality... You are committing sin and you are convicted by the law as transgressors. If you show that partiality, if you size up people, 
And by the way, don't you forever think <laughs> that those uh, that, that, are, that you may treat as less than don't know what you're doing. They can see what you're doing. They can see when you show that partiality. They can see when uh, they can see and they can observe the way that you're being a hypocrite about certain relationships. And we need to be careful. We need to be the kind of Christians that don't do that. Verse 10 says this, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. But if you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. What this speaks to, by the way, and what James refers to this. James, by the way, that wrote... Uh, the, this letter was very much, he was kind of a, he was kind of a, a, a Pharisee among Pharisees in so many words. He loved the Jewish law. But when he came to understand and believe that his brother, Jesus, was the Messiah, his whole attitude changed about the law. But he did see the importance of where the law fit in. For instance, the Ten Commandments. Who in here knows the Ten Commandments? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm not going to make you recite them. Don't worry. Okay, okay, but I'm, you know the Ten Commandments. Let me ask you this. Who in here is guilty of one of the Ten Commandments? Raise your hand. We all are, aren't we? Because in, and in turn, we're all, we're all, if we're guilty of one, we're guilty of all. Guilty of one, guilty of all. In the Ten Commandments, we, we're, it's a misunderstood that the Ten Commandments are just, well, just live by these and you'll be good. But that's not what the Ten Commandments were given to the children of Israel for. They were given to them to let them know that there's no way you're ever going to be able to live up to these. But there will be a Messiah that stands in the gap for you and makes sure that you can have that forgiveness you need because you'll never be able to live up to it because you're either an adulterer, you're a murderer, you're a thief, you're something, you're a liar, you're one of these, you're guilty of them, and because of Jesus and what he did for us, you can have forgiveness. The law was made to show us that we are uh, in, in a really bad place, but with Jesus, we can have forgiveness. 12.13 says, So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. There's another part to these passages in James, and it's this. Listen to me. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Now you may wonder what I'm talking about, because... We, we understand that we're not saved because of our works. But let me ask you this. If you have received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then should something be different about you? Should it? There should be something different about you. In other words, you, people... Uh, if. I, and I would even say this, uh, someone may quickly say a prayer in a church and say, Jesus come into my heart and run out the back and nothing's ever changed in their life, nothing's different. There is no sign of works in their life. It may be an indication that their decision was not sincere because there is going to be evidence of salvation when a person comes to Christ. There is going to be outward evidence of that. 14, verse 14, chapter 2 says, What good is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and one of you says to them, 
go in peace, but be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, then what good is that? So also, faith by itself, it, if it does not have works, is what? It's a dead faith. It's a dead faith. There's a term that, I, that I, I've heard used, and I, I think I, I do agree with the way it's said. It's called false conversion. False conversion. In fact, it, uh, the false conversion is where maybe someone quickly, as I said, says just says a quick prayer and then runs out. Nothing's ever different about them. And we need to be careful about this because it's when a person comes to Christ, we need to be able to disciple them, to ha give them a chance to grow and flourish as a Christian. We need, we need to be able to help to guide them in that Christian walk. 18 says, but if some, someone will say, you have faith and I have works, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. The evidence of salvation will always be there once a person comes to Christ. The evidence is going to be there. It's not what saved them, but it's evidence that they have been saved. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 clarifies the way that we come to Christ when it says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a, a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the evidence of your salvation is going to come through your works. Back to 2, 19 and 20. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? See, here's the thing about it. Even the demons, even the angels, the fallen angels of Satan believe that Jesus is Messiah. They believe He's Messiah. They believe that He is the Son of God. There is not a doubt in their mind. But it doesn't mean they serve Him. It doesn't mean that they will bow a knee to Him without force. And so what this says is, it, just believing alone it is, is not enough. It's going to come out in your actions that you are saved. It's going to show. The evidence is going to be there. It says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. We know that Abraham is in the hall of faith in Hebrews. And that Abraham, because of his Faith was able to follow through with this test and take his son upon the altar and show that his faith was more than simply words, it was actions. The scripture even in 23 says, was fulfilled saying, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone and in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute in the Old Testament by works when she justified by her works when received, when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is what? Dead. Today my challenge for you is you say that you've received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. What in your life is showing that you have received Christ? How is it coming out in your actions? How is it coming out in your mouth? Are you an example of one who has not just simply said, I believe, but it comes out in every part of your life? Where is the evidence that you know Christ? as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe today you've never received Him. And some of what has been said to you today is beginning to make you think. 
maybe it may be something in you there's just a little voice in you beginning to say you may need to to look closer at this and if it is i can tell you that's the holy spirit that is beginning to prompt you the altar will be open now if there's something you need to come and pray and leave before god today or or, or for that matter if you need to speak with someone come down we'd love to share with you how you can come to know christ as your personal lord and savior Whatever you do today, please take these words to heart and whatever you do, don't leave the same way you came today. Leave lighter. Leave with hope that you didn't have before. Would you pray with me?